The defendant and his counsel are present. All concerned with this trial are here, and you may now proceed, uh, sir. Now, Mrs. Maggio, you are still under oath. Would you state your full name again for the record? Luella Jane Maggio. Mrs. Maggio, are you the grandmother of Julia Lincoln, the little girl that was just on the stand? Yes, sir, I am. And do you recall the night of the fire over at her apartment? Yes, I do. And sometime during the evening, did some police officers bring Julia and her little sister Barbara over to your house? Yes, they did. To your knowledge, were the firemen still putting out the fire over at their house? Yes. How far away is your house from their apartment just roughly? Well, I can't say exactly, but it's just around the corner, not very far. If you were to walk outside your house, could you look over and see their apartment? Yes. And at the time that Julia came into your house, what was her emotional status? Well, she was pretty upset, I'd say. Did she appear to you to be excited? Yes. Was she crying at all? Well, yes, she was. Did you sit her down on a couch or something to calm her down? Yes. While she was on the couch, did she make any statement relative to what had happened? We object as calling for hearsay, Your Honor. She may answer yes or no. Yes, she did. What did she say? Just a moment. Do you have an objection on that? Yes, Your Honor. It's calling for hearsay and not within any of the exceptions to the hearsay rule. Do you wish to respond? A spontaneous utterance and excited utterance. I feel it comes within that definition. She stated that this was soon after the fire. How was she dressed at the time you first saw her? You mean, what was she wearing? Yes, she had on her night clothes, her pajamas. She had been to bed. Did you ask her any questions before she answered you? What do you mean, Judge? Well, <clears throat> did she make a statement to you? Yes, she was crying, you know, as though she had been crying. And I asked her what was wrong. And then she responded. Then she repeated what had happened. And she, thank you. I'll see you at the bench, gentlemen, with the reporter. Do you have any authority, counsel, for either of your points? I think, first of all, Your Honor, that this comes within the statutory definition in the evidence code. I think it would be section 1240. Now, the question here is how far removed are we from the particular episode? I am not sure from the evidence how much time had elapsed so as to bring it within a spontaneous statement doctrine. The leading case in this field is a civil case, Showalter versus Western Pacific Railroad, 16 Cal 2nd, page 160. They talk about the spontaneous declaration and they say that while time is a matter that must be taken into consideration, that is the length of time elapsing from the event to the time that the statement is made, the thing that controls this is whether or not there is a reasonable belief that the statement was one which is due to and brought upon by the event and where there was not sufficient time for the person to have calmed it down to where they can calculate a false statement. Your Honor, the cases cited by counsel to my understanding were ones where the spontaneous declarations were made at the scene of the event. In this case, the little girl's statement was made in response to a question. I think this would not qualify, and I would like to pursue further for Dyer if the court feels it has to rule in the prosecution's favor at this point. I think the question is, is there a reasonable assurance that this is not something that was fabricated, but is the truth that it isn't a self-serving statement on the part of the declarant? This goes to the basis of all the exceptions to the hearsay rule, and I think the facts here certainly come within the overall view of the exceptions of this hearsay rule. Obviously, there are those questions which are made either in contemplation of death, and there are those matters which are contemporaneous with the particular act, so that the response is purely voluntary, unsolicited. And then there is that kind of response which could be made after reflection, after thought. It would seem to me that this might come within the latter category. The mother sees the girl. She is brought home by the police officers. The mother asks her what happened. Certainly, if we have gone beyond 10, 15, or 20 minutes, it may well be that there has been an opportunity on the part of the girl 
to contrive if, in fact, she was so inclined to do. <clears throat> You are still under oath. Would you state your full name again for the record? Luella Jane Maggio. Mrs. Maggio, are you the grandmother of Julia Lincoln, the little girl that was just on the stand? Yes, sir, I am. And do you recall the night of the fire over at her apartment? Yes, I do. And sometime during the evening, did some police officers bring Julia and her little sister Barbara over to your house? Yes, they did. To your knowledge, were the firemen still putting out the fire over at her house? Yes. How far away is your house from their apartment, just roughly? Well, I can't say exactly, but it's just around the corner, not very far. If you were to walk outside your house, could you look over and see their apartment? Yes. And at the time that Julia came into your house, what was her emotional status? Well, she was pretty upset, I'd say. Did she appear to you to be excited? Yes. Was she crying at all? Well, yes, she was. Did you sit her down on a couch or something to calm her down? Yes. While she was on the couch, did she make any statement relative to what had happened? We object as calling for hearsay, Your Honor. But she may answer yes or no. Yes, she did. What did she say? In just a moment. Do you have an objection on that? A yes. A yes, Your Honor. It's calling for hearsay and not within any of the exceptions to the hearsay rule. Do you wish to respond a spontaneous utterance and excited utterance? I feel it comes within that definition. She stated that this was soon after the fire. How was she dressed at the time you first saw her? You mean, what was she wearing? Yes, she had on her night clothes, her pajamas. She had been to bed. And did you ask her any questions before she answered you? What do you mean, Judge? Well, did she make a statement to you? Yes, she was crying, you know, as though she had been crying. And I asked her what was wrong. And then she responded, then she repeated what had happened. And she, thank you. I'll see you at the bench, gentlemen, with the reporter. Do you have any authority, counsel, for either of your points? I think, first of all, Your Honor, that this comes within the statutory definition in the evidence code. I think it would be section 1240. Now, the question here is how far removed are we from the particular episode? I'm not sure from the evidence how much time has elapsed so as to bring it within a spontaneous statement doctrine. The leading case in this field is a civil case, Showalter versus Western Pacific Railroad, 16 Cal 2nd, page 160. And they talk about the spontaneous declaration, and they say that while time is a matter that must be taken into consideration, that is, the length of time elapsing from the event to the time that the statement is made, the thing that controls this is whether or not there is a reasonable belief that the statement was one which is due to and brought upon by the event and where there was not sufficient time for the person to have calmed it down to where they can calculate a false statement. Your Honor, the cases cited by counsel, to my understanding, were ones where the spontaneous declarations were made at the scene of the event. In this case, the little girl's statement was made in response to a question. I think this would not qualify, and I would like to pursue further for dire if the court feels it has to rule in the prosecution's favor at this point. I think the question is, is there a reasonable assurance that this is not something that was fabricated, but is the truth that it isn't a self-serving statement on the part of the declarant? This goes to the basis of all the exceptions to the hearsay rule, and I think the facts here have certainly come within the overall view of the exceptions of this hearsay rule. Obviously, there are those questions which are made either in contemplation of death, and there are those matters which are contemporaneous with the particular act, so that the response is purely voluntary, unsolicited. Then there is that kind of response which could be made after reflection, after thought. It would seem to me that this might come within the latter category. The mother sees the girl. She is brought home by the police officers. The mother asks her what happened. Certainly, if we have gone beyond 10, 15, or 20 minutes, it may well be that there has been an opportunity on of the part of the girl to contrive if, in fact, she was so inclined to do. I have no 
further questions, any redirect, Mr. McChesney, at this time, Your Honor, I would like to call Oliver Gonzalez. Very well. You are a fireman? Yes, sir. And on the 28th of December, 1967, close to midnight, did you respond to a fire at 3561 Gallup Drive? Yes, sir. Any place in the structure did you find or see a small child approximately four years old? Yes, sir. Where was this that you found her or saw her? You may use the blackboard, thank you, approximately right here in this area, indicating your honor for the record. It would be just into the hallway, just out of the living room, the hallway being that of the bedrooms and the bathroom. And what did you do after you found her there? I picked her up and took her to the outer door onto the landing and handed her to some people there at the entrance to the outside. After you did that, what did you do? I went back to the bedroom, and when you got to the bedroom, what happened? Well, it was quite smoky and pretty hot, and I didn't have any breathing apparatus on, and I crawled on my stomach to the area indicated where the large double bed was, and I could hear the moaning of a small child, but due to the intense fire coming off of the bed, every time I tried to reach up over the bed, without any face protection why I'd get a lung full of fire so I knew roughly what the area she was in but I couldn't get to that at some time after this was she handed to you by someone yes sir and who handed her to you fireman Tom Nelson who just testified what did you do after she was handed to you I immediately took her outside sorry I didn't hear that I took her outside Try to speak a little louder. Yes, I will. Did you care for her or hold her or do something until an ambulance came? Yes, I held her until the ambulance arrived and another fireman took a wet sheet and draped it over her in my arms and put a blanket over that. Did she appear to you to be awake during this time? Yes, sir. Now, were you also present at a car fire at the intersection of 94th and Apple Valley Lane? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I respectfully object to any questions with reference to this car fire unless there is some materiality shown. At this time, I object on the grounds it is irrelevant and immaterial. Do you desire an offer of proof made at the bench? Yes, Your Honor, on foundation. All right, I have no knowledge concerning it other than what we have heard in the opening statement. Counsel, please approach the bench out of the hearing of the jury. Now, Mr. McChesney, what is your offer of proof? And the offer of proof would be what I mentioned in my opening statement. I think it's highly material, number one, to prove identity. Secondly, to show premeditation. This car fire took place approximately a half hour before the apartment fire. The defendant shows up there. It's his car on fire. He ties his wife in to some extent with what went on to his car. He at that point asked to get into the trunk to get where he wanted to go. He then gets into a car, heads south in the direction of the gas station where he buys some gasoline. Let me put one or two precise questions for you may have lost me along the way. You say that it's material on one or two major grounds and what are they again? Identity. What is your offer of proof with respect to how this second fire will establish the identity of the defendant? The prior fire ties him in with this one. He asked for gasoline that was used to set the fire in the other place. He's mad and agitated because somebody has burned his car. At that particular location, he made a statement, I'll get that dirty so-and-so. Then he gets in his car and heads his car from that location towards the gas station which is where he bought the gasoline that was used in the perpetration of our second fire in the apartment. Any other grounds which you urge premeditation? It tends to show that at that particular point he wanted to get the gasoline to do something to somebody. He said that he was going to get somebody. What is the time of the first fire in relation to the second one? How much time lapsed between the car fire and the fire at the apartment? Would you say it was 15 minutes? <coughs> One last time. I have
have no further questions. Any redirect, Mr. McChesney? At this time, Your Honor, I would like to call Oliver Gonzalez. Very well. You are a fireman? Yes, sir. And on the 28th of December, 1967, close to midnight, did you respond to a fire at 3561 Gallup Drive? Yes, sir. Any place in the structure did you find or see a small child approximately four years old? Yes, sir. Where was this that you found her or saw her? You may use the blackboard, thank you, approximately right here in this area. Indicating, Your Honor, for the record, it would be just into the hallway, just out of the living room, the hallway being that of the bedrooms and the bathroom. And uh, what did you do after you found her there? I picked her up and took her to the outer door onto the landing and handed her to some people there at the entrance to the outside. After you did that, what did you do? I went back to the bedroom. And when you got to the bedroom, what happened? Well, it was quite smoky and pretty hot, and I didn't have any breathing apparatus on. And I crawled on my stomach to the area indicated where the large double bed was, and I could hear the moaning of a small child. But due to the intense fire coming off of the bed, every time I tried to reach up over the bed without any face protection, why I get a lung full of fire. So I knew roughly what area she was in, but I couldn't get to that. And sometime after this, was she handed to you by someone? Yes, sir. And who handed her to you? Fireman Tom Nelson, who just testified. What did you do after she was handed to you? I immediately took her outside. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. I took her outside. Try to speak a little louder. Yes, I will. And did you care for her or hold her or do something until an ambulance came? Yes, I held her until the ambulance arrived. And another fireman took a wet sheet and draped it over her arms and my arms and put a blanket over that. Did she appear to you to be awake during this time? Yes, sir. Now, were you also present at a car fire at the intersection of 94th and Apple Valley Lane? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Your Honor, I respectfully object to any questions with reference to this car fire, unless there is some materiality shown. At this time, I object on the grounds it is irrelevant and immaterial. Do you desire an offer of proof made at the bench? Yes, Your Honor, on foundation. All right. I have no knowledge concerning it other than we have heard in the opening statement. Counsel, please approach the bench out of the hearing of the jury. Now, Mr. McChesney, what is your offer of proof? Now, the offer of proof will be what I mentioned in my opening statement. I think it's highly material, number one, to prove identity. Secondly, to show premeditation. This car fire took place approximately a half hour before the apartment fire. Now, the defendant shows up here. It's his car on fire. He ties his wife in to some extent with what went on to his car. He at that point asked to get into the trunk to get where he wanted to go. He then gets into a car, heads south in the direction of the gas station where he buys some gasoline. Let me put one or two precise questions for you may have lost me along the way. You say that it's material on one or two major grounds and what are they again? Identity. What is your offer of proof with respect to how the second fire or will establish the identity of the defendant? Now, the prior fire the ties him in with this one. He asked for gasoline that was used to set the fire in the other place. He's mad and agitated because somebody has burned his car. Now, at this particular location, he made a statement, I'll get that dirty so-and-so. And then he gets in his car and hands his car from that location towards the gas station, which is where he bought the gasoline that was used in the perpetration of our second fire in the apartment. Any other grounds which you urge premeditation? It tends to show that at that particular point, he wanted to get the gasoline to do something to somebody. He said that he was going to get somebody. What is the time of the first fire in relation to the second one? How much time elapsed between the car fire and the fire at the apartment? Would you say it was 15 minutes? Okay. 225 first. <coughs> officer to where Mr. Alec was. Did you not? Yes. Did you notice any blood on Mr. Alec? I don't remember. How far away were you from him at that time? Not too far. Would you say that you were within five feet of him? Like, I don't know. Would you say like from about where you are to the council table? Maybe more. A little bit more? Yes. What about where I am right now? Yes. Would you say roughly what? Between 15 to 20 feet? Would that be about right? Yes. Now, you were able to see his arms at that time, were you not? You could see his arms, could you not? Yes. You could see his hands, could you not? I didn't look at his hands, I didn't look at him. 
You looked at him as a whole? Yes. Do you remember seeing his arms at that time? No. You don't recall seeing anything unusual about his arms? Well, he was like fighting, that's all I could remember. When the police came up to him, was he still fighting? Did the police have to pull him out of the fight? No. He had already stopped? Yes. And what did he do? Did he then just turn and look at the policeman? No. I told the policeman that it was him. And when you told the policeman that, what did Mr. Alec do? Did he face the police? I don't remember. Well, at the time you said, that's him, you looked at Mr. Alec, did you not? Yes. Did you see anything unusual about his arms? No. Did you notice anything unusual about his hands? No. Did you see anything in his hands at all? No. And thank you, I have nothing further at this time. Mr. Hugh, and thank you. Miss Rodriguez, how long after this wedding was this dinner? I don't understand. Was there a dinner between the time of the wedding and the reception? Yes. Where was that dinner held? On Hicks. It was also held at the same place the reception was? The hall, yes. Did you and your brother attend that dinner? Just me. Just you? Yes. Had your brother gone to the wedding? Do you know? No. He didn't go, or you don't know whether he went? No, he didn't go. When was the first time after the wedding that you first saw your brother? It was about 9 o'clock. About 9 o'clock? Yes. Was that in the reception hall? Yes. Was it inside or outside the hall? Outside. Were you with your brother during most of the time he was there before he got hurt? Before? Inside the hall? Yes, inside the hall. No. Did you see whether or not he had anything to eat or drink? No. Did you have anything to eat or drink? Yes. What did you have to drink or eat? We had, I drank punch, and I don't remember, I think it was some soup or something. Had you gone out of the hall on other occasions that evening before this uh, fight took place, or had you stayed inside? I was inside. How long before this fight took place did you leave the hall? Did you go outside before or after? Before. Let's straighten it out. You only went outside one time, and that is when the fighting was taking place, right? Yes. How long before your brother got beat up was it that you went outside? I don't remember. Five minutes, ten minutes, one minute, maybe four or five minutes, and you went outside with Bertha, is that right? Yes. Was your brother already outside? No. How long after you came out was it that you first noticed your brother outside? Two minutes. You said you observed some people chasing somebody up Hicks, is that right? Yes. Which way on Hicks was it that you observed them chase the person? Going down this way, away from Whittier Boulevard? Yes. Did you ever observe anybody chase anybody the other way on Hicks? Like going down Whittier, going down toward Whittier? Yes. When was that? Before Pee Wee hit my brother. Was that after or before you observed them chase somebody away from Whittier? I don't understand. Do I understand you to say that you observed somebody being chased away from Whittier? Yes. And you also observed somebody being chased toward Whittier? Yes. Which came first? Who? Did they chase him away from Whittier first or yes, away from Whittier? And when you observed a group of people chasing someone away from Whittier, did you observe anybody at that time having any weapons, tire, irons, chains, or anything like that? No. How much time took place between the time you observed them chase somebody away from Whittier and the time you observed them chase somebody toward Whittier? I don't know. Was it a long time? No. A couple of minutes? Yes. Now, when you observed a group of people chase somebody toward Whittier, did you see any tire irons, chains, guns, knives, any weapons of any sort? No. When is the first time you observed any weapons of any sort? When they were breaking the car windows, and that is the car that was parked where the diagram has a little marking there? Yes. That you marked, and that was right smack in the middle of the street. Is that right? Yes. Was it facing north or south? In other words, toward facing north down. It was facing north? Yes. Did you observe that car drive up to that position? Yes. Was somebody in it when they were breaking out the windows? I don't remember. How long before you observed them breaking out the windows did you observe that car drive up? I don't remember. Was it just immediately before? Yes. So you saw somebody? You saw the car drive up? Yes. And immediately after that you saw somebody breaking the windows out of it? Yes. But you don't know if anybody was in the car at that time? No. Had the car come to a complete stop when the windows were being broken out? Yes. And this was after Pee Wee had hit your brother? Yes. And that was the car drove up? Yes. After Pee Wee hit your brother, your brother ran over toward the parking lot where he got hit. Is that right? Yes. And as soon as your brother started running toward the parking lot, you ran toward your brother. Is that right? Yes. <coughs> Here we go.
go. This is a 200, four voids, five minutes, no lead in. Question by plaintiff's attorney. How many tire irons and so forth did you see at the time you saw them breaking windows out of the car? One, just one, yes. Is that the only tire iron you saw all night long when they hit my brother? Yes. Did you see just the one tire iron? Yes. You never saw more than one tire iron that night? No. If I may have a moment, Your Honor, you may. Do you recall testifying at the preliminary hearing in August in East Los Angeles court? Yes. Do you recall testifying at that time that you saw other tire irons that night? Yes. Do you remember now whether or not you did see any other tire irons that night? I saw that first one when they were breaking the windows and then I saw the other one when they were hitting my brother. So you saw two separate tire irons? I don't know if it was the same one or not. Well, did you see, only recall seeing one, is that right? At this time, you only recall seeing one tire iron? I don't know if it was the same one or not. Do you remember at the preliminary hearing when you were asked if you saw any other tire irons and you said you were asked how many others and you said two? Yes. Now, had you ever, to your knowledge, ever seen Mr. Bonilla before? No before the 24th of July. To your knowledge, other than in court, have you ever seen him since? Have you ever seen him since this night other than in the courtroom? No. You have never seen any pictures of him? No. You never went to any police lineups or anything like that? No. Did you talk to your brother about what happened between the time it did happen and the time you went to court there in East Los Angeles a few times you went to the hospital to visit him? Yes. Did you talk to him at all about what had happened between when you went to court last time and when you went to court this time? No. So you talked to him about what happened between when it did happen and your first court appearance, but you haven't discussed it since. Is that right? Yes. You said you got hit by somebody, but not with a crowbar. Is that right? I don't know if it was a crowbar or not. I didn't feel anything. They just hit me. Did you see who hit you? No. Somebody hit you? Yes. And that was in the shoulder and elbow area? Yes. Do you think it was a crowbar? I don't think so. Did it hurt real bad? Yes. Did you go to the hospital for it? They wanted to take me, but I didn't want to. Did you have any cuts? No. Any broken bones to your knowledge? No. You saw your brother hit with a crowbar, is that right? Yes. Did that crowbar look something like this tire iron? Yes. So that has been marked people's too. Did you ever see?